I want to kind of read you a few headlines that I've come across in the last few weeks. Uh, you know, since since we since we did our recent interview, um, and just you know give you a chance to kind of speak to them, perhaps. This is a drop head. Robert Malone claims to have invented mRNA technology. Why is he trying so hard to undermine its use? How, how do you react to this? So that's the Atlantic uh, um, hit piece. Uh, it was a very interesting article um, because it, it has a number of logic jumps in irregularities. And then it ends up kind of contradicting itself in the last paragraph and basically confirming that my assertions uh, about having been the originator of the core technology are valid. I'm subjected to this uh, meme that you didn't really do the things that you did in the late 1980s, almost continuously, usually from internet trolls. And so really, I think what the young author was picking up on in this was some internet memes that have been wrapped around uh, the prior press push that Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman were those that had originated the technology. Now that was, that was um, clearly false, but it was very actively promoted by their university, uh, which holds a key patent, and then um, advanced through Stat News, Boston Globe, CNN, and then finally the New York Times. We challenged that, and in the case of, of the New York Times, they actually recut their interview and podcast with Katie Carrico to cut out the parts where she had claimed that she was the original inventor. But how does how do I react to it? This this kind of pejorative use of language to cast shade, it doesn't really bother me. I I know what the facts are, and I have this massive amount of documentation. When people come at me with those things, I just say, hey, look. Here, it's on the website, here are the documents, you can make your own assessment. The thing that bothers me about all of this, um, where they're personalizing character assassination on me and, and character attacks, is that it distracts from the issues. And it's not about me. The, this, this kind of chronic uh, um, questioning, why would I be saying things about the ethics of what's going on? Why would I be raising concerns about the safety signals? What, I must have some ulterior motive. There's a, a, an underlying theme to all this mm. that I must have some ulterior motive. And th this particular journal, journalist asked me again and again and again, trying to get at what was my ulterior motive for trying to undermine these vaccines based on my technology. It was so paradoxical. Was the push in a whole series of questions he raised with me. And um, I don't know what it says about journalism or what it says about our culture, that we always assume that someone must have an ulterior motive, that it's not sufficient to just be addressing an issue because it matters, it, because it is the ethically correct thing to do. Um, it, it, there seems to be this assumption that everybody's got an angle. I think it says more about the author than it says about me. And so this kind of casting shade and aspersions on me personally as a way to avoid addressing the underlying issues, I just see it as kind of noise and, and a little bit sad. And, and it's almost an affirmation. If the strongest they can come up with is to uh, try to attack and cast shade on whether or not I made a significant contribution that led to over nine patents um, during the late 1980s. Uh, if that's the worst they can throw at me, I think I'm doing pretty good. So that's how I see it. Well, so sure. So you're not trying, quote, so hard to undermine the use of this vaccine technology. No, it's that my concerns here as I said, I think, in our prior interview, is that there's been a series of actions taken, policies taken, uh, regulatory actions taken that are at odds with how I've been trained, with, with the norms as I've always understood them to be. 
the regulatory norms, um, the scientific norms, these things have been waived. And I, it, I think for a lot of people, it doesn't make sense. And what, recall reeling back, what triggered this was this um, amazing podcast uh, with Brett Weinstein and, and Steve Kirsch, where um, I don't think at that point in time the world had really heard anyone questioning the underlying safety data assumptions um, and ethics of what was being done. There was a widespread sense of unease that these mandates and uh, forced, you know, efforts to force vaccination and uh, expedite the licensure of this and bring it and deploy it globally on the basis of uh, very abbreviated clinical trials. Uh, there was a widespread sense of uneasiness, but people didn't really have language to express it. And when that podcast happened, for some reason, it catalyzed global interest um, in a way that I didn't expect, that I still have people writing me. I just saw the Brett Weinstein Dark Horse podcast. Something happened there where, where events came together and uh, I expressed some things that I had just been observing that I felt anomalous in how the government was managing the situation and the nature of the vaccines and the testing of the vaccines and uh, the ethics of how they were being deployed and forced on, on children and other things in various countries, including the United States. And um, that, that kind of triggered a whole cascade. but. It wasn't because I have concerns about the technology or I'm casting shade on the technology. I've repeatedly made it clear that, in my opinion, these vaccines have saved lives. I get challenged on it all the time, by the way. There's, there's a whole cohort that says, oh, no, these aren't worth anything and uh, they shouldn't be used at all and they're not effective. In my opinion, they've saved a lot of lives and they're very appropriate at this point in time. The risk benefit um, favors administration of these vaccines with even with all we've learned since that in these few months since favors their administration to the elderly and the high risk popul populations. So as a you know, contrary to this, this thread of, of I'm trying to denigrate these and tear them down. No, I'm trying to say I'm all in favor, strongly in favor of ethical development and deployment of vaccines that are safe, pure, effective, non-adulterated. And, uh, I'm really strongly dug in that we need to confront the data as they are, not um, uh, try to cover stuff up or hide risks or, or avoid confronting risks. The, the way that we get, in my opinion, to good public policy in, in public health is we, we not only recognize those risks, but we constantly take the position of looking forward, looking for leading indicators of risk, performing risk mitigation, and monitoring for black swans, unexpected events surrounding that. That's, that's where I come from, is continuing really strongly believing that the norms that have been developed over the last 30, 40 years in vaccinology should be maintained. We shouldn't jettison them just because we're having a crisis. Why don't we do kind of a review? There's been a number of very significant papers in my mind in the last week or two that have come out on, with very robust data sets telling us, uh, again, to my less educated eye, um, some very valuable information. And, you know, if you agree, maybe you can kind of review some of this for us. I know, I know you've been, you know, studying every one of these in, in some detail. The emergence of the Delta variant, whether, you know, originally in India and then subsequently in the UK and then spread to Israel, has really thrown the public health enterprise globally and, and in these other countries back. 
because there were assumptions made about the effectiveness of the current vaccines and their ability to contain the outbreak. 